I'm Marshall Falk, and you watching Chopping It Up with Buck. All right, Marshall, man, it's good to get you on. I know we've been trying to do this, and, and this time, I guess, even as we've been talking about it, just with, with the quarantine and having to do this, it's giving you some introspective. Uh, talk, talk to me about that, because I think we were talking about 9-11. Katrina, you're from New Orleans. I've, I'm familiar with the city, love the city. But give me your thoughts on where we are, like, right now. What, what, what has it done for you as a, as a person and as a, just as a parent? This thing is serious. It's just it's just crazy how how when you when you when you when you just give it thought as to where we're at right now and how things are. You know, I I, I lost my high school coach. Oh man, sorry to hear that. That's when you really understand like where we're at. Yeah. And this 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 has really um it's really given me a, an opportunity to have perspective about life, you know, mm-hmm. in a sense of, of where I'm at, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. And, um, man, I'm telling you, I have, I've literally, I'm like, man, I, I need to slow down. <laughs> you know, and we, we make up every excuse to live the life we live and do the things we do. And, and you know, now, now I can see all that I missed And I'm like, I ain't missing it again. And I'm just, you know, in in a sense, in a sense, in every in everything that happens, um, there's something good that happens. And uh, you know, I've just found, I found my good in this. I'm like, okay, COVID, thank you, thank you. Yeah. You know, so it's It's it's, interesting uh, you say that, man. Everybody that I've talked to has kind of said that. And you were talking a little bit about your high school coach. We got to talk about high school and. You know, you were defensive back there, but you also were running back. And I think your high school – people talk – about. And I, I'll say this, and we'll talk a little bit about your football intellect because that was the one thing – I know you and I had to go see Andre Paul one day. We were on a long drive, and you were just breaking down. I was asking, what do you see when you see that? Where did <laughs> memory come from? Did it start in high school? Did it start with your six brothers playing with them? So it, it was fostered and I, you know, I didn't know at the time that was, that, that is what was happening to be honest with you. My high school coach literally um, just, just with the necessity to, to have teams stop focusing on me as a talent. Uh, and I'm just glad that my willingness to just trust in him mm-hmm and to do whatever I could do to help us win, I moved around. So quarterback, receiver, running back, split in, tight end, you know, it didn't matter. I moved around. And what that required was I had to learn a lot of positions. So for me, it was fun. It was like when we broke the huddle, they didn't know where I was going to be. <laughs> and, and, and it was our advantage. And it was like, okay, they had to prepare for me to be in different places but I didn't know what it was doing for me. It made it, as you, you know, people, you know, running back or, you know, quarterback or receiver or running back, DB. For me, I was a football player. And more than anything, I was a football junkie because I just love, I love being around the game. You know, I love, I love the sport. And I, whatever you asked me to do, I was going to do it if, if I felt like it was going to help the team. Yeah. Now you you ran track, you played football, you played basketball, all of those things. Did he see you doing those things or did he just say, hey, Marshall, I need you on this team because you're, you're versatility? No, he saw me doing everything. And so yeah. my high school was my high school was small. I went to an all black high school in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And um, and we you know, we it was it was one of the bad all black high schools. <laughs> so sometimes when you show up the games, you didn't know if you was going to have like 20 guys like 30 guys, 40 guys, 10 guys. It's like, how many are we going to have? But, but the reality of it was, you know, you know, we, um, I, I, I had to move around and I had to do a lot. And, and with that, with that, um, 
I learned a lot, man. And I, I grew and my just my willingness to just just do whatever I could do to win, it turned me into the football player that I was. So Wayne Reese was his, was his name, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and tell us about the the the. I mean, this is. I always ask people who were their influences. I know you were raised by your mother. You had six, you know, six brothers. Uh, but with Wayne Reese, did he not just a coach, but probably a father figure? Some of the other things. Yeah, he was. Um, he was literally man. You know, because my 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 father passed away. And, and Coach Reese was, you know, um, he was just that constant in your life, in your ear, reminding. I, I didn't even, I didn't think college was something that was for me. Like, that wasn't, that wasn't something that, like, that wasn't college? Like, what, really? <laughs> you know, people from my neighborhood, they didn't, they didn't go to college. That wasn't something that they did, but... But man, just 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 him instilling in me. And, and let, let me say this, and I'm, I, I want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah. Um, but you know, because I wasn't always the good kid, so a lot of the things that he did. Let's say I missed class. Somebody report I missed class to this to the you know to my to my coach. So now what I got to do is I got to show up to clean the boiler room. I got to mop the gym. You know, so his his way of 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 teaching, um, man, it was it was just it was, it was I I I appreciate everything he did, yeah. and I I didn't know at the time what he was doing or what he was fostering. Sounds like tough love, but the kind that you needed in that space where you were. Now, the the one thing that I thought was interesting. All these schools are recruiting you because the story used to be that well Marshall Falk was lightly recruited, but I, I I know to a person I talked to Dino Babers, I've talked to a lot of coaches that were around that area that knew and wanted to recruit you. They just didn't recruit you right. You wanted to play running back. Nebraska was right. A great story about right. That. So right. tell us about going to San Diego State with Robert Griffin, who I thought also this was interesting. He was honest with you on the recruiting trip. He didn't. Didn't sugarcoat it, but told you, and a, and a brother from the Desire Projects, he wants it straight, right? I mean, it, oh yeah, oh yeah. Straight. Tell us a yeah, little man, bit about it was, that. It was, um, you know, the whole recruiting story is <laughs> just funny. I mean, I sat in like legendary coaches' offices, and they told me that I couldn't play running back, and they told me all that I couldn't do and what I was not going to amount to. And I was just like, okay, that's fine. Not a problem. You know, and you listen and you don't disrespect, you know, as I was, I was raised, you know, my mom raised me right. But I knew what I wanted. I knew I was most happy with the football in my hands. And this was pre athlete position. Actually, I created them missing on me, created the athlete because they didn't they couldn't figure out what I was. If you watch me on offense, I broke the huddle. If you were trying to analyze me as a running back, I was a receiver. If you was trying to analyze me as a receiver, maybe I was playing quarterback. So you could never figure it out. And and just like listen, man, when you when you're when you have an eye for football, you know what you're doing, you know what you're doing. And when you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. All this combine and stuff that we do, if you need to see a guy in shorts run and do all this stuff. And you can't judge him based on the football games that he played for three years. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> All right. And, I agree with you. And that, and it, right. And that's, and that's what, that's what happened. You know, they, they did not want to give me the credit that they, listen, my state, my state in my high school all-star game, I started as a corner. They would not let me start as a running back. One guy, Ramon Malcolm, he went to Auburn. The other guy, Anero Chester, went to Oklahoma. Big time scholarship guys. We all go in college the same time. And I don't meet neither one of them in the league. Mm. But so that's I, how it I, is. I, I'll say this though. One of the things that you did at the at cornerback, 
you, you kind of left a legacy there too by scoring. You have what eleven interceptions and six touchdowns. So once you got the ball, you became an offensive guy. And I think San Diego State, you know, the, we know you had a great career there. You were Aztec. I always kind of kept an eye on West Coast football and. You know, thinking about, man, when, when that second game, tell us about that. Tell us about stepping on the college football field and then just exploding on the national scene. Because it's not like now with social media. You have to watch it. But I think everybody in the country were like, okay, San Diego State, Marshall Falk, who is this guy? Right, right. So so let me before we get to that game, Buck, I'm yeah, going yeah. I'm, I'm to take you back <laughs> to So training camp starts. So okay. I come all the way out here from New Orleans and training camp starts. And I'm like, we, we, we start practice, and back then, first practice, they let you know where you're at on the depth chart. I'm number seven on the depth chart. <laughs> seven, huh? I'm, I'm the like, seven. Did, you didn't have a number? Did you have your number next to you, or was it just seven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you got, you know, you got to request what number you wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and I wanted I, I wore thirty three in high school and I was like I'll take three of thirty three, and so three a running back wore three a guy named Kip Jeffries, and thirty three there was a senior who had never started a game, but he only played special teams. I was like I can't take his number, <laughs> so they literally gave me number twenty eight, mm. and I was like all right cool. I'm not going to, you know, request anything. So I'm wearing number 28, and I'm the seventh running back. By the time we got to the season start, I was second on the depth chart. All right? The first game, the first game, they kicked the ball off. Our starting running back was T.C. Wright. You remember Toby Wright? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it was Toby Wright's brother, T.C. Wright. He was uh he was whack player like honorable mention or something, offensive player honorable mention something like that. Well, TC takes it back. He he runs it, you know, and he's a little gassed. <laughs> Beginning of my first college game, he's tired. He come to get some water. What he they send me out there, throws me a little toss. I run up in there. I do a spin move. <laughs> Ball went flying in the air. <laughs> oh, man. First, first carry. And so they take me out. I get back in like late in the game when the game's out of hand. The next game, the second game you're talking about, mm-hmm. we uh, – let me see. I don't play at all the first quarter. It's the beginning of the second quarter. He catches a punt, and he's you know he, he, he's weaving through guys. Boom! Get hits on the thigh and get up in it, and he's still laying down. And I'm looking at him, and he limps off. And they you know they they looking at him. They tended to him. Coach Al Luganville grabs my face mask. He looks at me and said, "Hold on to the damn ball." <laughs> you say, and "Coach, so, I got you." I got you. And so I, I didn't even say anything. I just went out there mm-hmm. and I just played football. And so in the midst, I'm playing ball and I'm having this, I'm having this game like I've never had before. Because here, here's the thing. Think about this, Charles. Um, in high school, I never really knew my max potential because I played whole games. I played kicker, punter. I played every position on offense. I played every play at cornerback on defense. I returned punts. I returned kicks. So when the game started and I went out there to either return the kick or kickoff, I didn't leave the, the field, field yeah. yeah, until halftime. Wow. So, so now I'm in college, and I, I'm only playing running back. So you're like, oh, I can do this all day. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> So in, the, in, in, in this game that you're talking about, that I rushed for like 387 yards, I had a total of 422 all-purpose yards and seven touchdowns. Remember, I missed the first quarter, mm. and I didn't play the second half of the fourth quarter. 
<laughs> so did well, you tell that? Did you ever that, say you probably could have five hundred yards easy? Just, I mean, just, just keep it in perspective. Yeah. What I did in two and <laughs> <laughs> two and a half, quarters. two and a half quarters. You know, it, it's it's wild because when you when you think about it, a guy comes out and has that kind of game, right? And easily you can say, okay, everybody's marking you now. What did teams start doing gimmick wise to take you away? Because you know you, you had a great first game, but you had a really great career at San Diego State. I mean, you know, college, college football Hall of Fame, pro football Hall of Fame, all of that stuff. But what did the team start trying to do? Was there? I, I'm imagining there were gimmicks and things they were trying to do to take you away because uh, y'all had a really good team at the time. Too. Let's not let's not get it twisted. Y'all had some really good players, started a pipeline of NFL guys, so we, we know that to be true. But what did the team start doing to try to take away number 28? Yeah, they didn't um, – it, it was funny because it took a while before they really bought into that That I was me. Mm-hmm. Uh, teams would literally – oh, no, it ain't going to happen today. It ain't going to happen today. And then, at the, you know, after games, man, good, 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 good game. Good game. <laughs> you know, the typical stuff. <laughs> But but all the hoopla, you know, they 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 took it for exactly that. They took it for hoopla. Yeah. They didn't really buy into that it was what it was. And so, you know, I um I was raised to not to not really engage in the in the whole banter, especially in high school because I played whole games. Yeah, you know, preserve, my coach preserve said, the energy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's how coach used to talk to me. Like, man, look, we need you to save that energy. Yeah. There's no reason. There's no reason for you to engage with them, and 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 waste energy because we need that. So, so I just didn't. I didn't really, didn't really engage in any of that. But, but man, it was. Uh, they did everything. Yeah. I mean, stack the box. But we had, you know, I I played with with Patrick Rowe was the first rounder. I played with Darnay Scott. You know, he got drafted first pick. He was first pick of the second round. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of other receivers that, you know, got sprinkled around the league. Some linemen that played in the league for a while. So, I mean, offense-wise, I mean, outside of what, what, what the University of Miami was doing, I mean, we were, we were it. Yeah. You, know, you wanted to, you wanted to yeah. see the numbers we put up. I mean, we were putting up. 40, 50 points a game. Yeah. You know, Marshall, getting drafted by the Indianapolis Colts, uh, you know, talk to us about that. It was You were the second pick of the draft in 94. Uh, you know, you held out a little bit, and I got a great story about that when you first <laughs> the bill. But just just talk about leading up to that. And now you, you said before, you didn't think about college. I know you knew you were going to – I mean, you growing up around the Superdome, you worked there as a kid selling popcorn to watch teams play, really. You really wanted to just get in there and see the games. But tell us about that being drafted in the second the second pick of the draft by the Indianapolis Colts. Yeah, man, that was um, – you know, when they, when they talk about reality TV, that was like reality TV, but, you know, it, and it was before <laughs> reality TV because, you know, I had, I had no idea – that you know, you, you don't know, you don't know what's in store for you. You have me, you know, you don't know. And I go to college, and I'm just happy to get a scholarship to go to college. You know, before that, I, I had no idea that that college was going to be was was going to play a huge role for me. So, you know, I'm just I'm just I'm just having fun. Mm-hmm. I knew I it was like, hey, I'm gonna get this education. I got my free education. I made sure that, you know, I got mine and, and that, um, you know, they're going to get theirs. That's always the case. <laughs> and, and your so, agent, Rocky Arsenault, I know you guys, it, it was interesting. You held a, a little bit, which you have to do. I, I know it's a business decision, but I, I'll say this. I tell people this all the time. Uh, I can remember blocking and there's a certain, you know, you, I, I may, may have been a week. I don't know, maybe two weeks. I don't remember how long you were out. But the very first play, I'm blocking on a toss sweep. And usually I feel you, you got to hold the block for a while, right? But I, I tell people this all the time. All I remember is whoosh. 
I said, <laughs> that just went by. And we're in shorts. We don't have on pads. I mean, it's, it's just, but you knew right away that 10-3 or 4-2-8 or whatever, whatever you had to, because to me, it seemed like whatever you had to run, you ran. I don't know. You probably could have ran faster, but a 10 300 meter is, is moving. And you grew up idolizing Barry Sanders. I had to imagine you knew Thurman Thomas. I played with Thurman. Oh, yeah. I, Thurman and you reminded me a lot of each other. And I will tell you that all the time. But tell me your, 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 your guy that you looked up to growing up as a, as a running back. And who did you pattern your game after? Yeah, so, so for me, um, I just – I basically wanted to, you know, in playing – there wasn't a specific guy that I wanted to pattern myself after. It was just, I wanted to make sure that, that I, that I could do everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, Thurman, what he did, uh, Ronnie Harmon was a guy that, that I worked with a lot being in San Diego and Ronnie was in San Diego. University he used to Iowa. always say, yeah. yeah you want to be a complete back. You want to be a complete back, you know, and I, and, and, and that was the thing for me. So, uh, did you ever I mean, come you across remember? Marcus Allen? Marcus Allen? Yeah. Was yeah. Got yeah, you. Marcus, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. 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 Marcus, Marcus and, and, and Eric Dickerson, they were guys, you know, being out here in Southern California that, that kind of took a liking to me and helped me with different stuff, you know, but, but for me, for me, Buck, it was more, it was more or less really watching film and studying everybody and learning what made each back what they were. Mm -hmm. And when you understand that and you understand what defenses do to stop them, once you know why they're good and what they're good at doing, what they're, you kind of get in my kind of a, you get into the mind of the coordinator that's about that you're about to play with. You know, because it's, it's, it's all a chess match. And for me, I, I always wanted to know, like, so what are they going to throw at me today? What am I going to see that's new? What's and I was always yeah. into that. Yeah, what, what one defensive coach kind of you always said, I got to have a little bit more. I got to have this, this, and this, as opposed to just – because you, you said it best when we were driving uh, – to Muncie or somewhere that day or Anderson. I can't remember where we were going to get back to get our knees worked on. But we're saying, yeah. I made the first guy miss. I, I'm thinking about always. the second, third guy. Yeah. Always. First guy always miss. First guy always <laughs> miss. Always. <laughs> but, well, um, I, I, yeah, and, and I know that to be true, but is there any defensive coordinator that was able to say, okay, like Jordan had, you know, the Pistons and they had the Jordan rules. Who had the Falk rules? Who had things that could – kind of take you away or made you work even harder than you needed to or thought you would have. So, so it wasn't really, it wasn't really like that. It was just who made the game more complicated? Like mm -hmm. who made me think about more than I wanted to think about? Okay. And it was only two guys that did that um, consistently. Uh, one guy was with us, Jim Johnson. Okay. You know, man, Jim, Jim was, Jim was probably for, for a guy who played quarterback at Mizzou, he knew how to disturb an offense. Yeah. He just understood how to do and, and it was all about disrupting the quarterback and the flow of whatever made the offense work. And Jim just did unsound things, but he covered it up with, with like with, with with he dressed it up well to, to where you had to like endure something in order to get him. Mm. He's and, underrated um, too. I think he's one of those guys that not enough people give credit to. What? He yeah, does. I agree. Yeah, and then uh, the other guy uh, was Wade Phillips. Wade was just consistent with five man pressures. Wade was going to bring five man pressures. He he just he just didn't like rushing four. It was five man pressure, and and in the three four, um, once you covered up the tackle. And you had a you you had a guard that wasn't good enough, that couldn't fan fan out to get to the outside mm -hmm. rusher. That meant as a back, I had to take on a known rusher. And so in his days when he was at Buffalo, he put Bruce Smith he put <laughs> Bruce Smith over the tackle, and outside yep. him was Cornelius Bennett, 
So if you don't fan, just think if you fan, yeah. now you put a guard on Bruce Smith, you're getting a sack. And yeah. if you don't fan, you put a back, a, a small back like me on Cornelius Bennett, you're getting a sack. <laughs> yeah, we always talk about big on big and, you know, smaller on big is never good. But, you know, you bring up a really good point. Ted March, your brother, though, he really knew how to use you in a way that kind of put you all over the field. He, oh, yeah. And Ted, what I always liked about him, when we come off the field, he would say, hey, what do you see? He's always asking, what do you see? And, and, and he would really talk to you about that. I think the other thing is Gene Huey, and Gene and I talked a, a few months ago, he always talked about how hard you work, and not just running the football, not just catching the football, but your pass protection. Get in there and, and, and go after Bruce Smith, even though, you know, you know, hey, man, we know, hey, Bruce is going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, Gene, um, Gene was the best thing. You know, Gene was the best thing ever, man. He, uh, yeah. at the time, you know, when you're young, you just, you just fight in the fight. You know, me and Gene, <laughs> I, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, it, it, it was like having another father just getting on you about everything. But consistently what he was doing was just making me a better player. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, um, man, I have so much to thank that man for because it's, it's, it, it's like, um, you know, two times this happened to me in my life. When I was with Gene, he got on my nerves, everything he did, it bothered me. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> but I didn't know. I didn't know what he was doing until I left. And I, and I, and I, then I got a chance to see what he instilled in me because he was no longer around and all the habits and things that I now had to fall, I had to use in order to get myself ready it was all in place. Yeah. What he had built. It was just like when, you know, when you, when you leave your parents' house and you go to college, you know, curfew and all the stuff that your mom make you do, the stuff that you hate doing, once you get on your own, you realize how much of a routine it is and how much, okay, these are the things I have to do. <laughs> so it just prepares you for real life, man. And you hate it when you're going, when you're living in it, but once you get out of it and you get to use those resources, you're so thankful. And I, I thank Gene every time for, for putting up with me. I was a hothead. You know, I, I, I knew it all. I wanted to know it all. You know, but Falk, I'm going to tell you this. You, you, you did it in a way. You must have learned how to cuss under your breath really early. No, I was respectful. I was yeah, respectful. You, no, but you never could tell. I, I knew you enough to see, okay, he's getting hot. But Gene must have known how to handle that because sometimes when a guy gets upset, you can escalate the situation. I never saw you be disrespectful with Gene. No, I, never. As long I never, I never let, I never let anybody, I never let anybody um, have that over me. Like nobody was going to, nobody was going to have the power of control over me and get get to see it. Okay. That wasn't happening. Never. But but that's interesting. What you took away and what you're able to then. You know, you worked through, you, you were with the Colts. Uh, I know you look at that situation and there was some, you know, you wanted a, a new contract, didn't happen for you. The Rams, that, that opportunity to go to, to the Rams. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so going to the Rams, man, was, was a unique situation because it was almost like, you know, the feeling, the feeling you feel when you show up at your first training camp. Um, didn't know many people. And, uh, and you had to prove yourself. And that's literally where you sit. You know, I, I sat in a, in, a, in, a, in a place of, you know, I had to prove myself. I had to prove to them that, that I was who I was. And, and when you sit in that position, you know, that's, that's just what you have to do. And so I was okay. I was okay with it. But what I found out was that mentally, it was some guys that was in the same place as me that was tired of like, like why why aren't we why 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 can't we win a Super Bowl? Why can't that be us? And that was we went into that season with that thought process, like, man, why why can't that be us? Like why why not? How does how 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 do, how do we not how can that not be us? Yeah, Kevin told us a great story that about how you guys all came together. How 
you know, I, knowing Dick Vermeil from his UCLA days and knowing the guys that have been around him, knowing how he ran training camp, but, you know, getting all of that together and, and, and getting you guys to play as, on one, one sheet of music, how, how was that? You know, it was it... – <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So so for me, for me, I'm a self-motivated person. So I, mm -hmm. I never needed anybody to motivate me to do anything. You know, it was like just just to just short competition was enough for me. If I showed up and we were gonna compete, that was enough right. for me. Yeah. Um other people need other things. And I had been around a bunch of different things, but I had never been around and seen a coach cry. So it was, it was, it was unique, man. You know, I just, and it was understood that he cared, but man, I was just like, I, I didn't get it. Like it, <laughs> fuck, <laughs> you I, couldn't I, understand like, it. <laughs> right. Like I just, I was like, I was lost. I didn't, I didn't, I, I just didn't understand it. And so, you know, I just, uh, man, it was uh it was weird, man. I'm not gonna lie that to you. To one, that had to be one uh, of the most talented group of offensive uh, players put together. I know, I mean, there's been some talk about who's the best, but just tell us about from your perspective, seeing that every day, being around those guys, watching y'all worked hard, but the the ability to score and score quickly and a lot. I mean, this greatest show on turf. I know. So many people talk about it, a prolific offense like that. What was it like to be in that offense every day and be such a key component of it? Yeah, it was fun, man. I'm going to tell you, it was, it was, it was, it was the, the most fun that I've ever had playing ball. Mm. And, 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 and here's, here's the thing. We, we, we genuinely, we, if one person scored a touchdown, we all scored a touchdown. Mm. Like, that's where the whole bob and weave thing came from. You know, we, we literally, everybody celebrated everybody's success. My first, my first, like, three games there, I mean, I came from, from anywhere. I was touching the ball down there every, damn near every, <laughs> every, every yeah. day. You almost like I, high school only on offense, right? <laughs> right, right. And I'm and I'm now playing and I'm like, you know, this this is this is weird. You know, because I'm I gotta like I gotta I literally, man, I gotta I didn't I didn't even touch the ball much and we, we're winning games. I'm talking blowing people out. We'll we'll take a break and we'll be right back. Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. Or get your giants, get you hyped, get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Thin Energy. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? So, you're talking about a guy that trajectory with you very same, similar. Same yeah. trajectory, man. Okay. And it, okay. It, you know, it's, it's crazy, but because you know, sometimes you don't know, you don't know, you you, you just you don't you don't really have an idea, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, so I show up. I'm 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 on a recruiting trip at Texas A&M, and I walk in. And I, R.C. Slocum, you know, Marshall, 
well, what, well, what do you think I'll school? And I say, RC, I like it here, man. I could play here. You know, I just, they have Kevin Smith showing me around. He plays corner, but I want to play running back. He said, well, I'll be honest with you. And most coaches won't do this, but the guy that just walked by you, he's Mr. Texas this year, and he just said he's committed. <laughs> so we don't have a position for you at running back. And I'm like, damn. Oh, right? Man. Three years later at the Combine, I meet this guy. You know, we, we're, doing, we're doing the drills. Same kid. We meet, shake hands, we talk. Five years later, we both get drafted. Five years later, I get traded to the Rams. I walk in the meeting room. I sit down. He's sitting right next to me. Same kid. <laughs> he literally looks at me and he says, we're kind of the same. And I was like, I just shook my head at him. Okay. He said, well, there's not enough football. There's not enough footballs here for the both of us. And I just was, I said, well, I didn't ask to be here. They traded for me. How'd you get here? <laughs> and so um, we go through preseason, and I don't play the first two preseason games. By the time I get ready to play in the third preseason game, you know, he, he got a chance to see me play. I play in the third preseason game. Now, this story that happens with he and I, is a big story, all right? Because in that third preseason game, Trent Green goes down. Kurt Warner is now the starter. This guy whom Mike Marks coached him, but he mf him and said he did so much wrong. And, and we didn't know, we didn't know his coach's style was he never coached the starter. Everything he wanted to say to the starter he said it to the backup as if he did it wrong, but he wanted to start it here, but he didn't want to start it to be gun shy. So we just thought Kurt was just this, this dude that just couldn't do anything right. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, you know, Kurt would, Kurt would practice well, but Mike would, everything was wrong, Kurt did. Your footwork wrong, this is wrong, that was, Basically, he was talking to Trent Green through Kurt. Even Kurt, when Kurt wouldn't mess up, he would correct Kurt, something he wanted Trent to hear. We found that out later. But meanwhile, Trent goes down, Kurt comes in. We got the short week. You know, they get rid of the players. And you remember that hard, that hard last week before you get rid of camp? And oh, then, yeah. You know, you oh, got yeah. the last preseason game when you didn't have enough bodies. And we just had to – we were taking more reps. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, it was like one of the worst <laughs> practice weeks getting ready for the season. And we're going through that. And our last game is against the Detroit Lions. And the guy that was sitting next to me was literally playing for the Detroit Lions by week four of the preseason. And I walked up to him and I said, I guess you're right. There wasn't enough footballs here for the both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to say his name. <laughs> you got, you got. I can't call his name off. Okay, all right. I can't call his name. I'm not going to put him out. He's all a good right. brother, man. We yeah. cool. He had a heck of a college career. He actually had a pretty decent, he had a pretty decent um, pro career as well, you know. But if he would have just stayed there, because I was the sharing. I mean, I came out, I, you know, I spared time. I played mm -hmm. whole games a lot. But I, I, you know, I, I spared time. But it was just funny that we went through that. He and I. <laughs> it was just hilarious, man. That uh, that that was that was that was how it went. But that season, man, it was just it was impressive. You know what we what we accomplished with everything that we had going on. You know, we weren't supposed to be where we were, and a lot of things that happened wasn't supposed to happen. And uh, a lot of sacrifices was made on that team, man. So many. 
Well, I, I know too, you know, you and I used to play in some golf tournaments in India and you started learning how to play golf. And I can remember the first time we, we all both played. It was crazy. And I can remember as you, you were taking lessons you were, and, and, and really got good. I mean, I'm, I'm like, look at this dude hitting the I mean, you're striking the ball everywhere, talking trash, got your hand back. Tell us about your golf game. And I know you like smoking sticks. I do too. Some, you know, some good bourbon with that. But tell me how that golf game progressed while you played and now even after you played. Yeah, I am. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in love with the game of golf, man. It, it, the game of golf, when I tell people, it, and it's just the honest truth, man, it, it saved my career. Mm. How's that? Um, it, uh, you know, uh, I, was, I was actually struggling – I was struggling probably like year three, probably right around year three. Um, and, and a lot about golf, you know, um, there's a guy named Brad Mays who worked at Eagle Creek and he yeah. was my teacher at the time. And Brad started explaining golf and just things about golf to me that, that, I started to use those things in the game. You know, I like, um, I, I wasn't, you know, you become a professional and, 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 and sometimes the game, you lose, it loses its fun. You know, yeah. you're not the little kid playing anymore. You're getting paid to play and there's expectations of what you're supposed to do and you just want to go out and play and have fun. But the pressure of what you're supposed to accomplish, you know, it, it, it can start the mount. And and fuck, I, I don't think people. Tell, huh? Yeah, I don't think people realize. I just want to go back to what you said. You were struggling, and that's when you were really starting to take off in your career. Yeah. You know, from yeah, a football but, perspective, you were really starting on a trajectory, but you said it was a struggle. And I don't think people realize how sometimes the game isn't fun that you right, played right. for so long. Is that is that what right. the struggle was? Right. Yeah. It was like you know, I was I was I was doing well. And I was putting in the hours and I was grinding at it, but it wasn't fun. And, and it was funny because I was having trouble taking practice range to golf course. And so what Brad showed me was on the practice range, I was just hitting the ball. On the golf course, I was worried about where I was hitting the ball. Mm. And so you can't, you can't worry about where you're hitting the ball and play golf. <laughs> yeah. You just got to play golf. You, you hit the ball on the range. You play golf when you play golf. And so in football, I started to take the analogy of every play was a, was a, diff, was a game. Like, mm -hmm. that was a play. Whatever went good or went bad, erase that next play. So it's like, it's like when I hit a golf shot, if I hit the ball in the water, like go to 10 cup, think about 10 cup, because that's the movie. And a lot of people, unless you really play golf, you don't understand why Kevin Costner kept grabbing the ball. It wasn't because, you know, he was bullish or, uh, you know, he was braggadocious about or overconfident. It's simply the analogy of just because something happened in that time doesn't mean that it's going to happen every time. My routine is all I can do. I'm expecting the better result. Because if you're worried about the result, then your routine doesn't matter. Like if I run this route every time and I catch the ball, it doesn't matter if you put a defender there or not. None of the things around you matter when, when in routine you do what you do because when the game is on the line and when pressure happens and things happen, guess what I go to? I go to routine. I go to what I've practiced because that's the big muscles. That's what's ingrained. And golf taught me that to use that in football. So when the game got hectic, it was on the line, I was like, I am not – I've, I've prepared for this moment. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for the game to come to me. So I'm just going to do what I, I, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's where it, it allowed me to actually 
it, it set me free in, in, in being able to play the game with no restrictions, no worries. And if I was ever surprised, if they did something that, that I didn't study or they didn't show me, it was like, you got me, but you can't do it again. <laughs> you only going to get me one time. That's it. That's all you're going to get me once. But once I foul it, we're good. Yeah, yeah. I just want to talk to you about this, too. As you talk about struggling but coming back and, and getting things on track, Roger Craig, yourself, Christian McCaffrey, who is here in Charlotte now, who I get to see a lot and who patterns his game a lot after you, you talked about him being possibly a better version of you. You guys are the only three players to ever have a thousand rushing yards, a thousand receiving yards. I, I, I got. I, I have to find out. You know, a seven-time Pro Bowler like yourself, all the yards you put up. I mean, it, it, the stats are crazy. But for you to say that about Christian McCaffrey, I'm gonna say just one thing. I went on a a, a camp visit to uh, Stanford. We got to talk to everybody. Didn't get to talk to McCaffrey. But in talking to David Shaw, the one thing he said is, I've, I've seen Marshall Falk, and he and I had that long conversation about you. I said, I played with Charlie Garner. He talked about a couple other players. He said, this kid, when he doesn't want to get tackled, won't get tackled. Tell us what you see from a guy that has been there, because there's, there's only three of you that have ever played in the game ever to get a 1,000 and a 1,000 club. You said he's possibly able to get it again, maybe yeah. even after. Yeah. Talk, yeah. talk to me about that. Yeah, so so when I when I did it, so think about when, when Roger did it, they weren't really throwing their running backs. Yeah. And, and and when I did it, it was like, oh my God, they're throwing their running backs. And now when you come into the league, you better be able to catch the ball as a running back. It's a huge part of the game now. So when you equate that with his skill set and talent, and just with the with with now. And, um, you know, I don't want to be mistaken, but the game is softer than what it was when we yeah. played. Um, this kid, it, 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 there's no reason why he can't. And, and, and let me say this. I studied what Roger Craig did and how he did it. you got to make yourself available. You have to be in the best shape possible because you never know when a check down can go for 80. You never know when a simple handoff can go for 70. So you got to be available at all times. A home run could happen on fourth and one. You know, you never know. You got to take that play. You have to be available. So he is that. Like he he embodies. Pe people don't really understand what he just did. So I did it. Roger Craig did it with Joe Montana. I did it with a two-time league MVP and Kurt Warner. This guy just did it with some bums. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? I got you. <laughs> <laughs> he did it with some bums. But it is so hard. Teams can't, like, when they focus on you, your quarterback has to be able to take that focus off of you. He didn't have that. And that's crazy, man. I just, I just, it, it's impressive. <laughs> it's impressive, man. It's impressive what he did. Yeah. So, Falk, you talk about, yeah, he did not have very many talented players at the quarterback position. And that, you know, that's the one thing. Hold on, wait. I think at the quarterback, to... what receiver? <laughs> well, at the receiver? At the quarterback? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Barely had an offensive line? Come on, man. You got to get his dude some props. <laughs> I'm just looking at like now that they think yeah. they're putting some pieces yeah. around him. People don't understand what he did. What he did with what he did. That's impressive. Yeah, man. yeah. It's impressive. It is, it, it is really impressive. When you know, like I talked about with earlier with you, when everybody in the stadium knows you're going to get to touch the ball and you still are able to make things happen. That, that's the hardest thing, you know, when, when you think about this. I, I, I want to get back to one last thing before we talk a little bit about, I know you, you, you said you like a, a good stick every now and then. I got a Padron here. Can't smoke it in the house, but boy, it's going to be smoked this weekend. And I got whatever bourbon you like. I, I know Angel's Envy, uh, 
you know, we got a bunch of different ones. A little plug here for, for chopping it up with Buck. But I know, you you know, what what is your stick of choice when you uh, are, are sitting back on the back thinking about those old memories that you have? Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I have a Partagas Series D. Okay. So, I'm, you know, that's, that's my – I literally, I literally, um, I was in, I was, I was down in Cuba. I went to Havana and, you know, it's, uh, it's impressive, man. It's impressive. Yeah. It is impressive. Did you get to go on the plant and watch them making it and you getting to see all that? Yeah. I haven't yeah, had I a chance. The, I got the, I got the real tour. Oh, wow. Tell, tell yeah, us a little bit about tour. that. What, what, what is it like to go in there in a place where, you know, you know, I love the Cohibas. I love the Partagas. But what is it like when you go in those places and you see these guys, you know, at, at their craft? They are yeah, outstanding awesome. at what they can do. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I was um, I was impressed. I mean, and literally, that's all they do. They sit there for hours. I'm talking, you know, eight, ten hours and just roll cigars. That's it. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. just mm. Like, that's all they do. They don't do nothing else. It's like, it's like nothing to them. Yeah. I think you can close his eyes and roll a cigar without even <laughs> missing it. Another place I was in, um, I was in, went to Honduras, and you know they got a, they got a good brand. They got some good brand off brand of cigars that you don't hear about. You know you hear about Cubans all the time, but you know the Hondurans, they make some good cigars too, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marshall, I, this is one quote I want to have you kind of expound on because it was something that I thought was really interesting, and you mentioned it earlier about your your uh, high school coach Wayne Reese being there for you, but you said there are people who grew up in rough environments and just don't hear about it, uh, and they make it in business, Falkland said. I don't think that makes what I am. What makes me what I am is that, I, that you have success, but you keep your head on straight and you make the right decisions in life. Sounds like you said some of those things that you were talking about earlier when you had a, a great mentor, and Coach Reese, and all the other coaches that have come in your career, how have you been able to keep your head on straight and make the decisions when they needed to be made? Well, it, it, Buck, it's just it's remaining humble, man. Understanding, mm -hmm. understanding how you was raised, you know, understanding what went into you becoming you. Because if you lose perspective on how you got here, man, it's um, then you get lost. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's a lot of guys that um, and and and, and I'm, a, I'm it's easy to fall into the trap. You know, you yeah. start, you start, especially in the social media world, you start to believe what they say about you and to you. <laughs> and when it's all good, it's good. And then when it's all bad, they're not talking about you. But when it was good, they were talking about you. So you just got to, Buck, and, and here's the thing, man. I, I have grown up, you know, from the, from the kids you knew that came in, I have grown up. But my core values and who I am, you know, you, if you say you know me, you know me. And that's that's it, you know. I've I've grown as a man, but but my core values and what I stand for and who I am that was given to me, you know, in the early years of my life, and I pass those on to my kids because those are the values that I feel like I carry around with my last name, not my yeah. first name, with my last name, and I do my family proud by respecting the brand and what they what they what they built and what they instilled in me, and I hand that to my kids and say. Hey, do me proud. And that's yeah. all I ask. Don't do anything. Just do me proud and be respectful. How, how difficult was it to walk away from the game? I know you said you struggled. Oh, man, it was, yeah, you know, um, yeah. I, I, think, I think we don't talk about this enough. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was, it was probably the most, the most challenging thing that I've ever done. You know, because when you love something so much and you've put so much into it and you have to say bye to it, and um, and you don't know what's next. Yeah. Um, you know we 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 struggle with that. And I think if we continue to talk about it, we're going to let the guys that's coming out of the game that's pounding their chest that think, oh, I have business, or oh, I have TV, or oh, I have radio, or oh, I have this and that. It's not going to it's not going to fill that void. Not even family. This game means a lot to us. And it, it takes a lot from us, and it gives a lot to us. So when you walk away, you better understand something's going to be missing. And, and you can't just put your family in there. You can't just replace it with love. You really got to identify with who you were in the game to who you're going to be after the game because, hey, when you walk off that stage, the NFL, 
They don't care who you are. They're going to close the curtain. They're going to cut the lights off. And they're going to say, here's next. <laughs> they're going to introduce, the, they introduce the world to the next person. Yeah, yeah. It hey, fall, matter. fall. Just like when you get hurt, they move the ball 10 yards. The girl keeps going, right? That's it, keep, man. This thing, uh, this thing has to keep going. Yeah, the shield, the shield is not going to stop. I, I think the one thing you, you brought up that's really interesting there is COVID-19 and this pandemic. So even more than what I was getting into, it's, mm -hmm. it's caused me to really look a little bit more inward on where I was in my life and what I was doing. You know, um, you know, I'm a business, I have businesses, and I'm always doing things. And I'm, I'm always equating activity and doing things as making money and earning a living and seeing it as this is what I have to do to pay the bills around here and make things happen. <laughs> but in reality, man, this is, um, this is giving me a perspective. I mean, man, I walked around my house and I saw things in my house that I'd never seen. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Uh, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that was here. You know, I've met parts of my house that I've never even met. And so um, perspective, man, I have a, you know, and I'm not waiting till I come up out of this to change. I've just made the change. You know, I'm a, I'm a be, and especially for my kids, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a definitely be more present, you know, because regardless of how present you are, you can't be present enough. You almost have to annoy them with your presence. So when they don't get it, they miss you. Hey, Falk, you got to be in the hip pocket, man. You got to be yeah. like right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, that's, that, that wasn't me because I, you know, I like to give them their space. I want them to grow up. I don't want them to be in my shadows. But in a sense, you know, I need to at least be in their shadows so they know when they turn around, I'm there. And um, I'm not afraid to say, you know, man, I, listen, I've been hustling, man. I, I love getting after it. I love working. I love doing stuff. I love being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I love fight for causes that I believe in. And I love, I love help, helping people, you know, fight for causes that they believe in. And, um, you know, just being present is something that, that, I, that I owe my kids. And I owe, I owe my family. I owe the people who love me. And so it's, I, I have perspective now. And it, you know, it took a goddamn virus to <laughs> be a part of it. But you know, you listen, man. Um, if you don't know, you can't grow. And now I know it's a must. I, I have to grow in this area. And I've everything that I've ever tried to tackle, um, just by tackling it and, and admitting to it and in, in, in the cause of action, you're better. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just I just take it steps further and that's what I'm doing. Two minute warning here. We're gonna we're gonna put you in a two minute drill because I know you like to score 136 touchdowns over your career. Real quick, would you become an agent? I know you've been working out with some guys, getting some guys in position. With, with, is that in your in your cards? So um, so it was funny. Uh, me and my agent Rocky, we were talking about being an agent, and um, and you know he and I we've worked so much together, and uh, he said to me he was like, so do you think you can go take the test and pass? I was like, I can go without taking, without studying, for I can go take a test and pass. And I think, fuck, I missed it by like one answer. I missed oh, it by man. one answer. You go literally, pass it. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> so, you know, when, once he saw that, he was like, man, that's, that's crazy. Like, you didn't, even, you, you didn't even study for it. And so, you know, I, I, I don't, so I don't want to be an agent for why agents are agent. I want to be an agent for cause, you know, I want to show, I want to, I want to, I want to be the first agent who fired his client for not being the right kind of person he should be, regardless of how much money the agent is making. Gotcha. Gotcha. Why don't you, uh, coaching wise, never coaching in your, in your cards. I know you, I know you talked about that a lot, but from the coaching standpoint, the intellect there, why didn't you ever think about coaching? Yeah, I'm a control freak, Buck. And you remember, you, you remember, I just, um, I don't understand why people can't do their job. You know? <laughs> and if you're getting paid to do it, I really don't understand why you can't do it. And if you're making millions to do it, I really don't understand why you can't do it. 
<laughs> in order to be a really good coach, you have to understand the man who can't. You got to understand the people at the bottom of the roster along with the people at the top of the roster. And I can motivate the people at the bottom of the roster, but I don't know if I have inside of me what it takes to constantly um, remind somebody what they can do if they're getting paid to do it. Hmm. Interesting. Lastly, I'm going I'm to let you score here. This, this is easy for you. We're in, the, we're in the red zone, scoring zone. I got it easy. I'm going to score regardless. But oh, score I know you're going to score, but I'm, I'm putting the ball there because these are, you're making plays. Last one. Before you get to that stick and that bourbon, the best gumbo you can find in New Orleans. For these folks that don't know, off the beaten path, you got to know a good gumbo spot. Well, I mean, if it was uh, if my mother was still alive, I'd, I'd sure tell you. Well, we, we her, know that. <laughs> that would be that would be like that would be like primo. But um, if I had to say, it would either be um, if Emeralds does his traditional gumbo, you go to Emeralds, you know. But sometimes Emeralds always he giving you a, he he switches he up. To play, he messes with things a little bit. Yeah, he yeah. does. He does. But if he does his traditional seafood gumbo, you can't you you. you there's nothing better than that. The only thing that's close is uh, GW Fins. All right, GW All Fins right. In, in New Orleans. You you can't you can't mess up with that, man. Yeah, well, I knew you were gonna score and go for two points and and then run off the field, <laughs> run up in the stands and clap. Everybody. Gotta do the most, man. Man, I, I really appreciate your time, man. It's been good catching up. We got to do it more often. We always say that when we see each other and when we text. Let's, my, my charge to you is going forward, you're going to get a text from me. You're gonna, I'm, I'm going to reach out to you. We're not going to do this. We're going to get together. And when, we get, when you come to Charlotte or I get your way, we'll have that stick and we'll have a, 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 a bourbon and we'll, we'll chop it up that way. Is that good? Likewise, bro. Appreciate it, man. All right, man. Thank you, man. Have a good Much one. love, bro. Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. Go get your joints, get you hype, get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit painstopcbd.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. 